Hello and welcome back to Mrs. Torres' YouTube channel. Today we are going to continue writing formal proofs. We are in the part of your packet where it says tons of proofs. We're going to do five of these together today. All right, let's look at number one. Let's mark up our diagram. Remember, that can be very, very helpful. So D is the midpoint of AB and AC is equal to BC. This is the same as saying segment AC is congruent to segment BC. They just didn't have this stuff up top, but it's still legal the way they wrote it. All right, so let's mark it up. AC is congruent to BC. All right, and we got to remember D is the midpoint. So let's start our proof. We just rewrite what we're given. D is the midpoint of AB, and AC is congruent to BC. I'm just going to write it like this rather than how they gave us because this is how I want you to write it. All right, and that was given. So we're trying to prove these two triangles are congruent. Let's look at what we're given and see what statements we can write from that. So it says D is the midpoint of AB. Well, that means AD is congruent to DB because that's the definition of a midpoint. Remember, whenever you write things down in your proof, make sure you also mark them on your picture. It'll make it easier to see which uh, triangle congruence theorem we're going to use. All right, next, I've got a side and I've got a side. I'm thinking, okay, side, angle, side, or side, side, side. Well, we don't know anything about the angles, right? But we do know that they share that side right there. So we can say CD is congruent to CD by the reflexive property. And in turn, the triangles are congruent by uh, side, side, side. Now, there are two extra rows in this proof. I am not going to give you any extra rows in your graded proofs. So when you get your graded proofs, if this was given, you would have exactly four rows. So I won't give you any extras. Um, I just decided to be a little nicer this year. All right, let's look at number two then. So number two, we are given angle one is congruent to angle two. So that's here. And triangle ACB is isosceles. We need to remember what isosceles means. This means two congruent sides. All right, so let's just write what we're given. Angle one is congruent to angle two. They just are using the measure, so they're using the equal sign. I'm going to stick to what we've been doing. It means the exact same thing. And triangle ACB is isosceles. That was given. Okay. So there's not much to get from this. That's just a fact. But let's use uh, triangle ACD is isosceles. So if it's isosceles, that means two sides are equal. Well, those sides are going to be AC and CB. So AC is congruent to CB by Ooh. definition of isosceles. Okay, so what else can we figure out? Do we know anything about these angles? No. Anything about these angles? No. Well, they share something, right? So CD is congruent to CD, again, by the reflexive property. So then we've got side, angle, side. So triangle ADC is congruent to triangle B. DC by side, angle, side. Now, I want to note with this one, let me get another color here. Instead of this line here, so we could have replaced this line with something else. We still would use the definition of isosceles, but because these sides are equal, what else do we know? Well, we know opposite angles are congruent. So we could say angle A is congruent to angle B. It would still be definition of isosceles. So now we have angle 
angle side. So that would just change this to angle, angle, side. So this is one of those proofs that there's different ways to do it. Whichever you see is fine. If you want to just ignore the green stuff and go with the, the purple-ish, whatever, that's fine. But I just wanted you to be aware that there's actually two ways to do this one. Either way is fine. You don't have to have both. All right, flip it on over. Let's check out number three. So number three, we've got this little picture over here. We are given QR, remember two vertical lines means parallel. So QR is parallel to ST. Let's mark that. And QT is parallel to RS. Okay. Now, fun fact, does anyone remember what this is called? All sides are parallel? Well, pairs of sides. This is a parallelogram. That's what our next unit is. So just a heads up. All right. Let's write down our given. QR is parallel to ST. QT parallel to RS because that's given. Okay. So remember, when we're given parallel lines, we're thinking corresponding angles, alternate exterior angles, alternate interior angles. Uh, in this one, our parallel lines are here and all of our angles in between. So we're thinking corresponding angles or alternate interior angles. Well, if we redraw this over here, so QT and RS, and we think of that as a transversal. Um, what angles do we have here? Well, we could say angles three and four, so this is three and that's four. Those are congruent because they're alternate interior angles. So let's say that angle three is congruent to angle four because alternate interior angles are congruent. Remember, this is only true when lines are parallel, but we do have parallel lines. All right, then if we look at QR and TS and we have our transversal, this is angle one, this is angle two. Well, look at that. Those are alternate interior as well. So angle one is congruent to angle two. Same reason. This one, we actually need an extra box here. I think when I made the key, I put these on the same line, which is totally fine. Or we can just add an extra box down here. All right. So now we have one and two are equal, three and four. I know it's getting a little messy. Uh, we also know they share RT. So RT is congruent to RT by the reflexive property. And then we have enough info to say the triangles are congruent by angle, side, angle. All right, there we go. Like I said, if you combine these two on the same line, that's totally okay since they use the same reason. And then you would have enough boxes. But I just added an extra box. No biggie. All right, we're going to skip number four because it's something we've seen so many times before. And we're going to move on to number six. Sorry, number five. Number five. All right. So we, I'm going to actually redraw this picture because it's kind of small. And when I start marking it up, it's going to start looking very crowded. So I'm just going to redraw my picture here. I think this is F P and C. Okay. So like I said, I just redraw this picture exactly because once I start marking it up, this little one gets a little, little crowded. Okay. So again, I know we've got T up here. So we're trying to prove F P T is going to go to C P T. Okay, cool. My diagram is right. All right. So we are given Angle 1 is congruent to angle 6. Angle 7 is congruent to angle 8. Let's mark it. So we've got 1 and 6 are equal. 
And then 7 and 8 are equal. Okay, cool. That was given. Hmm. All right. What else can we do here? Well, we have some supplementary angles, right? 1 and 2 are supplementary. 5 and 6 are supplementary. 1 and 6 are equal. So remember, that means, like, if this was 100 and this is 100... Well, that means 5 is going to be 80. Well, 2 would also be 80. So no matter what 1 and 6 are, 2 and 5 will be that same number. So we can say angle 2 is congruent to angle 5. Um, and we can say definition of supplementary. Remember, supplementary means we add to 180. All right, so now we've got here and here. All right, so we've got two congruent angles in these triangles. So we're thinking either angle side angle or angle angle side. Well, can we prove anything about TF and TC? No, not really, but they share a side. Good old reflexive property. TP is congruent to TP by reflexive property. And that means we've got angle, angle, side. So triangle FPT is congruent to triangle CPT by angle, angle, side. So really the only different thing that we saw there is the definition of supplementary. You will need to use this at least once on your graded proofs. I think it might just be once, um, but I just want to make sure we're good with that. All right, last one that I want to do together number six. All right, so I'm going to redraw this picture again. These are very small, and I like to write kind of big. So I'm just going to redraw it. A, B, C, D, E, and then one and two. Okay, so we're given B, E, bisects A, D, and angle A is congruent to angle D. Okay, so we've got angle A and D, and of course that's given. We can't pull any info from that, that's just a statement, but we do know that BE, so that's here, bisects AD. So that means C would be our midpoint, right? So we can say AC is congruent to CE by definition of bisector. Now, one mistake that I see a lot of people make is they also say that BC is congruent to CE, but we don't know that. We're not given that DA bisects BE, we're just given that BE bisects AD. So we don't know anything about BE except that it is a bisector. Okay, so now let's look what we've got. We've got an angle, we've got some sides, okay, so we're thinking, well, we've got lots of possibilities, but when we have these pictures, we definitely know that we have what type of angles uh, in the middle here, vertical angles, and we know vertical angles are congruent, so angle one is congruent to angle two, vertical angles are congruent, Okay, do we have enough info to say the triangles are equal? I think we do. Angle, side, angle. So triangle A, B, C is congruent to triangle D, E, C by angle, side, angle. Because that side is in between our two congruent angles. All right, that's it for today. See you later.